Good morning. We're going to be uh, in uh, Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6 again. We're going to be uh, addressing the aspect of this passage that talks about defending the faith. Paul writes, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So Paul starts off, as we've already talked about in the past few weeks, making an appeal as he is in prison, locked up for the sake of the gospel. He uh, asked that they, his readers, those in the church in Colossae, would pray for him, that he might have an opportunity, that a door might open, that he might make known the mystery of Christ. And we discuss what that mystery is in the past two weeks. And this week we're going to discuss what he is asking for prayer for, that he would make known the mystery of Christ. And then what he instructs those in Colossae to do, that they would have their speech seasoned with salt that they might know how they ought to answer each one. Or in other words, that they would give a defense for their faith, that they would proclaim the gospel, that they would proclaim the mystery of Christ. We addressed this a little bit in one of the messages in the past few weeks that we, when we spoke about um, how Christians are to be people who are to be concerned with proclaiming the excellencies of Christ with making known who Christ is. Christians aren't people who just have a faith and then they go and live their lives like everybody else in the world. We don't depart from here on Sundays and then go and live our lives throughout the week as if uh, there's nothing different than us, than everybody else. We are people who have been set apart. We are people who have been made into new creatures. Um, Our lives are not concerned with the here and now. The Bible says that we're aliens and strangers in this world. That this world is not our home. It calls this body a tent. What is a tent? It's, It's not a permanent residence. It's something that you pitch in the woods as you're going, as they did when they were journeying, journeying through the wilderness, when we read about Israel after they came out of Egypt, they threw tents everywhere they went when they went throughout the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't have a permanent residence. And that going through the wilderness is a picture of the Christian's life, that he is in this world, but he is not of this world. And so us being not of this world, it affects our speech what we talk about because God's placed something in our hearts. He's placed the glory of himself in our hearts. He's caused us to know him. He's caused us to believe in him. And because of that, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth is going to speak. We're going to go over a few few passages in scripture that are relative to this one in Colossians where he tells us, to have our speech seasoned with salt that we might might know how to answer each one. First passage is 1 Peter 3.15. And um, all of these citations are going to be from the Lit V or the KJ3, which is a very literal translation of, of Scripture. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready for defense to everyone who is asking of you an account concerning the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience so that whenever they speak against you as evildoers, they may be ashamed. 
those who are maligning your good behavior in Christ. For if the will of God wills it, it is better to suffer doing good than doing evil. Also because Christ suffered once for sin, righteous for unrighteous, that he might lead us to God, indeed having been put to death in the flesh, but having been made alive in the spirit. So as we go down through these scriptures I have for us to consider today, I'm just going to make brief comment on each one. It says, to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, would be, which would be synonymous in the Colossians passage, is having our, our speech seasoned with salt. We set, a, we set apart the Lord God in our hearts as holy. He's separate. He is our God. And, we sh and, and in doing this, in setting him, him apart in our hearts, we should be ready to give a defense to everyone who is asking us concerning the hope that is in us. You know, our assurance, the faith that God has given us has hope. And that hope is certain. It is certain because Jesus Christ is the one who, according to this passage, suffered once for sin the righteous for the unrighteous. And we give a defense of this hope. We proclaim the gospel um, to those asking us. And it says, so that whenever they speak against you as evildoers, they may be ashamed. People look at our good behavior, the fact that we proclaim Christ to them, the fact that we speak against their evil deeds and we speak against their false religion, and they malign us as evildoers. Um, the world does this. The world looks at Christians and they, they, they call us evildoers. Um, the government tries to condone homosexuality and transgenderism and all the things that they are supporting today as good. And when the church decries that as sin and proclaims God's testimony that it is an abomination in God's sight, they call us evildoers for calling that evil. One of the ways they do that is they try to equate homosexuality with racism. It's not racism. We're, uh, homosexuality is something that's an abomination to God. It's something that's unnatural and not right. The religious world looks at us and our, evil, and our uh, good deeds and they call us evil by saying that we're self-righteous. That when we say that God sets us apart in our behavior and causes us to do good deeds in light of knowing the gospel testimony, they say that we're legalists trying to earn our own salv salvation when that's the very thing that we speak against. Because what? Because they, they don't think that the Christian can do anything good. They don't believe in any type of sanctification in the Christian's life that's practical. They only believe in imputed sanctification. That sanctification is just charged to you and God receives you as that. And so because of that, they think that anyone that would say that there's such a thing as practical sanctification is trying to compete against Christ's righteousness. But we teach what the scripture teaches, that there's two types of holiness. There's one holiness that God gives his people that justifies us. And then there's a type of holiness that God causes his people to walk in that has nothing to do with our justification or acceptance with God. God doesn't accept me because I love my neighbor, but he causes me to love my neighbor because he loves me. And he does, he's not going to let me be numbered amongst the world and, continu and continually walk or trod over the blood of Christ as if I have no regard for the Savior that I proclaim. You know, if I continually walk in sin that Jesus died for as my pattern of life, what would the world think? They would, they would think I have no concern for Jesus who died for my sin. If, if I have no desire to live holy, it would be a hypocritical testimony. And so they speak evil against us by calling our pursuit to do good works as legalism. Moving on in Jude 3, uh, Jude writes to contend for the faith. He says, Beloved, using all diligence to write to you concerning our uh, common salvation, 
I had necessity to write to you exhorting you to fight for the faith once delivered to the holy ones. For there came in certain men stealthily, having been written beforehand to this judgment long ago, impious, perverting the grace of our, our, our God into licentiousness, and denying our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude had desire to write concerning his common salvation that he shared with those that he wrote to, but he found necessity to write that they would contend or fight earnestly for the faith that has been once delivered to the saints. Because why? Because men in that time and in, in today's time creep into the church unnoticed and they introduce heresies. We're, we're going to continue to go through these passages that I've, I've put together for us today. But one thing I want you to think about is, is that there's a lot of people who in churchianity, in uh, false religion, who think heresy is something that's like not even relevant. Who think if some people think talk about heresy, that they're just non-loving. They think, I, I've even heard people say, well, such and such preaches from the Bible. How can, how can how can he be wrong? He opens up the Bible, and so he's talking from the Bible. How can he be wrong? The devil speaks from the Bible. That's that's what the devil does. The devil is an angel of light. The word angel means messenger. He has a message. That's what he did to Christ in Matthew chapter four. He cited scripture. That's where heresy comes from. A lot of people. Calvinists like Paul Washer and John MacArthur and Steve Lawson, they use men like Joel Osteen as a whipping boy. Anybody that has read the Bible with any sort of like just casually going through it can tell that men like Joel Osteen or Benny Hinn or any of the prosperity preachers are completely off from Scripture. Their heresy is not even subtle. They may have a Bible on their pulpit, but they're not teaching it at all. They're going to it and completely distorting the Word of God and just ripping it out of its context. And it's so blatantly, obviously false that it's not even hard to discern for anybody who's read Scripture or has any sort of intellectual understanding of what the Bible says whatsoever. It's men who actually appear to come in the truth that we're to be concerned with. It's men who actually have the appearance of godliness that we're to use our discernment and to detect their heresy. They creep in, Jude says. They, um, they come in and it's hard to discern them because they, they have the talk of the gospel, but they depart ever so subtly. Second Timothy 3.10, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, and you have followed after my teaching, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, endurance, the persecutions, the afflictions that befell me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, what persecutions I endured and the Lord delivered me out of all and all who will live who will to live piously in Christ Jesus will also be persecuted. So that's a telltale sign when we look at some of these men today and they go on talk shows and radio shows of worldly secular men or even religious men like John MacArthur was on the Ben Shapiro show. Ben Shapiro is a Jew and they see no persecution. They see no backbite to what the message that they're speaking. And in fact, they make millions of dollars off of writing books and speaking in conferences from the message that they are teaching rather than being persecuted. The disciples of the first century and the church in the first century was hunted down. They were, that, 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 they were hated because of what they spoke. They were thrown into jail because of what they spoke. They weren't celebrated in the public's eye. 
They had to hide in homes because their message was hated by the religious community and by the world and by the ungodly world, worldly community that didn't profess the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> so that's a telltale sign that they see no persecution, but they're celebrated and they make countless countless amounts of money where they're able to afford multiple homes off of off of the message that they preach rather than seeing persecution. Verse 13 of 2 Timothy 3, and evil men and impostors will invent will advance to the worse leading astray and being led astray. And you remain in the things which you learned and were entrusted with, having known from whom you learned. And because you have known the holy writings from infancy, which is our standard of judgment, we which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every writing is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for conviction, for, cor for correction. For instruction that is in righteousness, that the man of God may be fitted, having been completed for every good work. So here he says in verse 13, and evil men and impostors will advance to the worse, or worse to worse. I had a man one time who tried to tell me that this scripture right here means that um, when, when we decry what the Calvinists teach, the Calvinists when they teach about total depravity, and they say that man's not as bad as he can be looking at man's self-righteousness. And they say, even like R.C. Sproul said, even Hitler loved his mom. And so they think that that because of what it has the appearance of goodness, that man's not as bad as he can be. And so they, they deny the sinfulness of man by doing that because they're unable to discern self-righteousness, which is wickedness. Adolf Hitler did not love his mom. Nobody loves outside of belief in the gospel because love is fulfillment of the law to love God and neighbor. And so all we're doing outside of Jesus Christ is hating God and hating one another. There's nothing good that we do outside of Jesus Christ because whatever is not of faith is sin. According to Paul in Romans 14.23. And so... <clears throat> I had a man to tell me that this passage means that people are getting worse. And he, and he twisted this scripture to say that man is not as bad as he can be because it says that imposters will advance from worse to worse. But that, that's, that's an example of how not to read scripture because he's not taking into the context of what Paul's talking about. He's saying that evil men and imposters will, in, will advance to the worse or worse, waxing worse and worse, as some translations say. Which means what? Which means the heresy gets worse. Because he's talking about evil man, men and imposters. He's talking about how heresies will wax worse to worse. Not that man and his depravity gets worse and worse. Because man, we know from scripture, is as evil as he can be. Every, every intention of the thoughts of his heart are evil and evil continually. But what does get, get worse is the heresy. And what makes a heresy worse? What did we just mention? What makes heresies worse are when they appear to be more like the truth. What makes counterfeit money harder to detect when it looks like the real thing? When, when, you, when you forge a check, what makes it a good forgery? It looks exactly like the real thing. So what makes a heresy worse, what makes imposters and evil men wax worse to worse is that they get closer and closer to the truth. Joel Osteen, who says you can live your best life now and that it, the, the, the claimant or the name it claimant heresy is not something that's waxing worse to worse. It's an obvious heresy. And even the Arminians who say that Jesus died for everybody and that you, that they condition salvation on your choice of God rather than God's doing and dying. That's not waxing worse to worse. That's complete legalism. That's complete. That, that, that's works versus grace. They just call it grace. 
They're teaching a works-based gospel that says, do this and live, that says, ask Jesus in your heart, pray this prayer, believe this message in order to be saved, rather than the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save his people from the wrath of God, and that he lived a righteous life that he would impute to them when he gives them faith, and it's on that basis that they are received and accepted into his presence. That's grace, what he did, rather than what we do. Works is what we do. And so that's, that's a clear, obvious, false gospel. It's not waxing worse to worse. What's waxing worse to worse is that when men look at that and they call that heresy, and then they depart from the faith by denying uh, God's predestination of men under wrath, as some do. And they say that God just passes over these people and that there's basically no purpose for them in hell, that God has no purpose. And so they're denying God's glory that way because the purpose of God in everything is his glory. And, but yet they would call this heresy, but they're only concerned with the salvation of their own skin. They haven't been made to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ because they see no purpose for of God in the destruction of the reprobate. They think that the reprobate are just the leftovers or just those who were left over to be judged and damned because of their own sin rather than God. As, as uh, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, that God has created all things with a purpose even the wicked for the day of evil. So what did he create? The wicked. How do you create the wicked? Well, they're created for, meaning the purpose of their creation was the day of evil so that God could be glorified in his wrath because the purpose of God in all creation is his glory. And so the point of this, bringing up this passage, of what I'm pointing out about this passage is that in defending the faith, there's heresy that's over here that looks like monopoly money. And it's like, okay, well, that's false. Like Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn and all these guys that the Calvinists completely rip and just tear up because what are they doing when they bring those guys up, by the way, when I say that they use them as a whipping boy? They're bringing these guys up to take, take your eyes off of their heresy. They treat them like a whipping boy. They're, 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 they're beating up on them so that you don't notice their lies and their heresies. They're pointing out the obvious so that you don't see their more subtle heresies. <clears throat> and, and, if, and, if you, and if you speak against John MacArthur and Paul Washer and John Piper and Vadi Balkum and any of these other guys, well, you're going to be torn down because amongst the Reformed, these guys are the Pope. They're the celebrity preachers that have been exalted. And how dare you speak against God's anointed? Because they're, they're, they're preaching the truth. And, and you're not, even if you come with scripture and expose their lies. <clears throat> and then you have the more, more subtle people amongst the sovereign grace men who would say that Arminianism is heresy and even say that Calvinism is heresy. But then they subtly deny the faith by denying what do we just say? God's glory and his wrath over vessels of wrath that he has prepared for destruction. Or by saying that there's no such thing as practical sanctification that we talked about. And so they deny the faith that way and that they think that we can just live whatever way we want to live after we come to Christ. And when you listen to a lot of their sermons, what's lacking? What's missing? All their sermons are all focused with Imputed righteousness and what they preach about imputed righteousness to an extent is correct. But what's always lacking is what's in the second half of Paul's letters, the therefore or the instruction. In light of this, in light of the mercy of God, we're to live this way. In light of the grace of Christ, we're to conduct our lives in this way. There's always the therefore, and that's never in their sermons. It's always spoken about as, and yes, we should do good works, but those good works don't justify us. It's just like a little tidbit added on instead of chapters talking about how the Christian should live. And we know that 
none of that living contributes to our justification. But amongst us, we don't have to say that because we're grounded and established in the gospel of grace. All right, moving on to Second Peter 2 1, it says, But there also came false prophets among the people, as there will also be false teachers among you who will stealthily bring in destructive sex, even denying the master who bought them, bringing quick destruction to themselves, and many will follow out their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be spoken as of as evil, and in covetousness, with forged words, they will make merchandise of you, whose judgment of old is not idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So much like Jude mentions that, you know, their their judgment is not asleep. Men who actually come into the church and pervert the gospel, they've been marked out for this condemnation. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 that they're to be accursed, which means turned over to destruction. Now, that doesn't mean that all false teachers are accursed, but it means that those who come into the true church of God and pervert the true gospel are accursed because that's the context. Paul himself was a false teacher in Judaism. But Judaism was not the true church of Christ. It didn't profess the true gospel of grace. But those churches who are true churches who actually are founded on the true gospel and men creep into those churches and pervert the grace of God. That's God revealing to his people that they are men who have been marked out for this condemnation. They are amongst the reprobate instead of the elect. And God's people are to make that judgment for the protection of the flock of God. So moving along, if you might have noticed, we've been in this passage now for three weeks. And one of the things I want to speak about is how are we to read scripture? Why have we been in the same text pulling ideas and doctrines out of the same passage for the past three Sundays? Because words have meaning. And when the apostle wrote to the church in Colossae, you can read a lot of things in scripture and you can see that Paul um, understood that those who were listening to this had an idea of what he was talking about. In other words, like if I were to stand up in front of a group of people and I were to proclaim the gospel, I might give definitions to words that I'm talking about because I don't have an understanding that this group of people would have a familiar, would be familiar with what these terms mean. But when Paul wrote in scripture, he wrote with the presupposition a lot of times that these people understood and knew the scriptures. Like, like a lot of passage, like we went over the passage in, in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he said, observe Israel after the flesh. And he, and he said that what they do over there in the temple is that they're offering sacrifices to demons. And he, and he called them, Israel after the flesh, he called them Gentiles. And so Paul expected for the people in Corinth to be familiar with the fact that the church of God is the true Israel. And so in saying that, I'm saying that because when we're reading this passage, we don't need to place this passage or any passage of scripture in a compartment all by itself. Right, re read it individualistically as if it was like confined away from the rest of scripture. When Paul uses words or terminology or makes statements, certain things would come to his readers ears because they were familiar with the scriptures. They had been taught. They knew they understood certain things like, I mean, uh, a good example. What uh, People don't teach you to read this way. You hear it all the time, like Paul's writing to a Gentile church. They didn't know nothing about the scriptures. Well, if you read like, like the book of First Corinthians, in First Corinthians chapter 5, Paul spiritualizes the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he gives no uh, ex explanation as to what the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover is. But yet, if you're going to understand the way that he spiritualized the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, that Christ is our Passover lamb, therefore let us celebrate the feast. 
not with the leaven of malice and strife, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If you're going to understand that analogy, you need to have an understanding of what the physical feast was about. But yet Paul gave no explanation to this to the church in Corinth, to the Gentile church in Corinth. Because the Gentiles, when you read the scripture, the way that it's written, the way that these letters are written, they had to have an understanding of the scriptures. And if you do a little bit of research in history, the Greek translation of the Old Testament had been circulated to an extent. They translated the Old Testament, what we know as the Septuagint, into Greek for a reason, because Greek became the common language amongst the, the people of the world, sort of like English has today. But they did so that people could read it and they could understand it. And these Gentile churches had more of an understanding of Scripture than what the majority of teachers today want you to think. They want you to believe because they think that ignorance is something to be celebrated. But these people who are receiving these letters were more educated about God's word than most people teach. And so the reason why we've been in this passage for three weeks pointing out things is because this is how scripture is meant to be read. And so when Paul says to walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. These are ideas like Christ spoke about salt in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so what it meant to have your speech seasoned with salt was an analogy that his readers would understand that was brought from the Sermon on the Mount, what salt meant. And, it, and in the, the Old Testament, salt was mentioned, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That's like straight, I mean, there's a cross-reference. That's why we have cross-references, because a lot of these ideas are picked up on from other writers. And so we want to bring in the whole of Scripture into our understanding of what this passage means. Because no passage of Scripture stands by itself. This whole book is one doctrine. It is one teaching. It is a whole. And it's all congruent together. There's no paradoxes. It doesn't contradict itself. It's one teaching. It defines its own terminology. It's own words. We can't just go to Webster's Dictionary and look up these words to understand it sometimes. Now, now we don't throw out our, the English language. But for instance, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then John 17.9, Jesus prays before he was crucified. And he says, I pray not for the world, but for those that you have given me. And so the word world there doesn't mean everybody. <laughs> it doesn't mean everybody in either text. But in the first text, in John 3, 16, it says God loved the world. In the second text, in John 17, 9, Jesus says, I don't even pray for the world. And so the word world is used in two different, completely opposite ways. And neither one of those ways that the word world is used can be found in Webster's Dictionary. They're defined by Scripture. And so it's important to also note that, that Scripture takes words and it uses them a certain way. It gives certain words a definition within the context of how a certain book or a letter is written. And so it's important to understand this so that we can know how we are to defend the faith that's been given, that's been once and for all handed down to the saints, so that we might know how to answer everyone that asks you for a defense of the hope that is within you. Everyone that you might know how to answer them, having your speech seasoned with salt. You need to know how to read scripture. You need to know how to understand God's word. And a part of that understanding comes from the Holy Spirit himself working on the mind of his people. All of that understanding, actually, excuse me. It's all given of God. It's all God molding the mind, opening the mind, opening the eyes of the heart to see and behold the things that are written within the scripture of God, that they can understand scripture from scripture. So moving on, what is faith? That's the next thing we're going to talk about because that's what we're to defend. What is our faith? 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. So faith is our assurance. Faith is the assurance of what we hope for. And in Scripture, what is hoped for is eternal life with God. What is hoped for is what we currently have now. And what we don't have now is the resurrection of the dead, which is the hope of every believer. If there is no resurrection, then our faith is vain, Paul says to the people in Corinth. If Christ, if there is no resurrection, then not even Christ has been raised. And if not even Christ has been raised, then your faith is vain and our preaching is vain. And we are of all people most to be pitied, Paul writes, because there is no hope. That's, that's what we hope for, to be raised, to be glorified with God, to be given to the Son by the Father as his gift that he has eternally loved from before the world was. That's our hope, and that's what our confidence is in, and our confidence is based on the Lord Jesus Christ's finished work, on his life, and his death, and his and the fact that he was raised, that gives proof that his um, work was a success. So that that is our faith. That is the faith of every elect, of everyone that has been chosen from before the world was, that the Holy Spirit gives them. And so heresies, what we're to, to defend our faith against, is that which is contrary to that. And so some of the heresies we've already mentioned, but we're going to go back and we're going to talk about some of these heresies in order. You have as one of the most predominant heresies of those who claim to be a church in our country, they teach that Jesus died for everybody, that God loves everybody, and God desires everybody to be saved. And they use that terminology, salvation. What they mean by that term, be saved, is that they would make the correct choice, that they would choose Jesus to believe in Jesus, and then that God would save them because they've chosen him which is the opposite of what scripture teaches. It is a works-based gospel, one that we've talked about that is, that is very obvious, but we're speaking about it now because it's the most predominant one that's taught amongst those who call themselves churches today. And so how it is false is that it, it is of works. What is a work? A work is anything that you do to get something in return. Like you go to your job of employment and you do what they ask you to do to get a paycheck. You meet a condition to get something. And so what do these people teach? They teach that Jesus died for everybody, both the people who go to heaven and the people who go to hell. And that your choice is what makes the difference in between heaven and hell rather than Jesus' death. Because if Jesus' death is doing the same thing for people who go to heaven, and people who go to hell, then his death is not what's doing the saving. It's your choice of him that's doing the saving. And if it's your choice of him that's doing the saving, then it's works rather than grace. Grace, by definition, is the opposite of works. Romans eleven six says, So then if it is of grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Grace and works are in separate categories. Grace means unmerited favor, unearned favor, undeserved deserved favor. Um, and the, 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 all of Scripture teaches that what Jesus came to do was to save his people by earning them favor, by doing the working for them. He didn't leave anything for them to do. Even belief is not a term of your acceptance with God. It's not a condition that you meet to get saved or to be saved because faith is not a work. But if you say that faith is a condition of your salvation, by definition, you're making it a work rather than what we just defined it as assurance. See, faith for these people cannot be assurance. But you turn to Hebrews 11 verse 1, and that's exactly what the author of Hebrews says faith is. 
Why can faith not be assurance for these people? Because they're not saved until after they believe. If you're not saved until after you believe, then you can't have assurance until you're saved. But God's people, they are given assurance because they were saved by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago when he lived a perfect righteous life for them. And then he died the death that they deserve to die on the cross, being made a curse of the Father and satisfying God's wrath on their behalf by bearing their sin and putting it away through the sacrifice of himself once and for all and showing that he accomplished that by raising from the dead three days later. And so that is the Arminian heresy, and I really don't like these terms because we're not placing these, using these terms, I'm just, we're not using these terms as something to connote uh, a secondary uh, disagreement within the church because it's not. We're using these terms just to identify false doctrine. The Calvinists are also heretical. How so? Because they don't see the glory of God as something that is primary to God. They deny God's glory. Uh, this is one way that they're heretical. We can talk about several, several ways that they're heretical. But what do they say about the fall? They say that God decreed the fall. Yeah, they'll, they'll use that word decree. But then when they talk about how God decreed the fall, they talk about that, that decree just like Arminian foreknowledge, that God looked ahead, saw who was going to believe, and so then he chose them on that basis of his foreknowledge that he knew who was going to believe in him. They say that God decreed the fall in the sense that God looked ahead and he saw that Adam was going to fall, and so then he decreed the fall. That's God still learning something, and that's God still placing his Christ secondary instead of preeminent, like Colossians says that, uh, Christ is to God, that he is preeminent to God. The reason why God created everything was so that his son could come into history and die and God could magnify himself. We've talked about these past few weeks how that is uh, the primary element of the gospel that God's people are made, made to see when they're regenerated. They behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what destroys their self-righteousness. The fact that they see that God has created everything for himself to magnify himself. And they see that in the cross that where God's wrath was displayed. Where God's love was displayed for his people. Where God's judgment of some that he didn't die for, die for is displayed. And yet that message is still proclaimed to them. And they're still held accountable to believe it. Believe it. But yet God blinds their eyes so they do not believe. The first six books of the Bible, I think, quotes that passage. Matthew through Romans, the passage in Isaiah 6, where it says that God has blinded their eyes. And he, it says, go on seeing and never see, go on hearing and never hear, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and turn and I would heal them. That passage where it specifically says God has caused them not to believe is exactly what it's saying so that they would be judged and God would be glorified because God has uh, chosen to destine some unto wrath. If you'll listen to my language, I'm, I'm citing scripture. Paul writing to the people in Thessalonica and he says, we know God's choice of you. We know that you've not been destined unto wrath, which means there are some that have been destined unto wrath. Um, and so Calvinists deny God's glory. They deny God's glory because they don't believe that the purpose of God in creation was his Christ. They believe that the purpose of God in creation was to give Adam the chance to live forever. And if Adam would have obeyed, as the Westminster Confession of Faith says, during this probationary period, then Adam would have earned eternal life in the Garden of Eden. And in doing so, he would have earned eternal life for all of his posterity. So then if that's the case, if that would have occurred, what would Adam have done? Adam would have been praised for all of eternity instead of God because Adam 
won eternal life for the whole entire human race and he didn't fall and eat the fruit of the tree. And Adam would have stopped and prevented Jesus Christ from ever entering into history and being the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Adam would have ruined the decree of God if that was the case according to the Westminster Confession of Faith. But that's not the case. But that is how Calvinists deny God's glory and how they express their hatred and contempt towards the sovereign God who has willed, who has purposed from all of eternity to fashion vessels of wrath and vessels of honor to magnify who he is. Another way Calvinists deny uh, the gospel is that they say man is not as bad as he can be when they look at his self-righteousness like I talked about earlier. Man is as bad as he can be. You know, who's worse, Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa? According to Scripture, Mother Teresa is because she lived her whole life promoting a false gospel, promoting a, a lie. You know, she sought to destroy souls where Adolf Hitler just sought to, to kill people physically. You know, Self-righteousness is condemned as a more heinous sin than complete immorality or lawlessness. Because why? Because, because it's seeking to steal, to arrogate the glory of God away from God unto yourself. It's seeking, it's seeking to steal that which God cherishes most, his glory, which is his son. And just like in Luke 16, 15, Christ spoke about the Pharisees and he said, ye are they that seek to justify themselves before men. But that which is highly esteemed amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. Jesus said that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said that their judgment would be more tolerable than for these self-righteous people who said that they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But yet they worship him falsely in idolatry because they had a false God and they said it was the true God. So these homosexuals, their judgment would be more tolerable, which means these people's sin was more heinous in God's sight. It was an abomination. And the Calvinists, when they look at men's self-righteousness, they say that's man not being as bad as he can be. God calls it an abomination. And so you see how their judgment is outward. You see how their judgment is physical. It's not God's judgment. They look on outward appearance rather than the heart. And you know, we can't see inside the heart like God can, but we can tell what's in the heart by what comes out of the mouth. And we can, we can try to have our judgment as close as to God's as possible. We want our judgment to be in line with, in line with God's judgment. <clears throat> they also deny the gospel. Calvinists do. in the fact that they say that the atonement was sufficient for everyone, but only efficient for the elect. And when they do this, they're doing it in order that they can proclaim the gospel alongside the Arminian. Primarily, they say things like this. They use language like this. But when they teach this, what they're saying is, is that if God had wanted to save everyone, he could have because there was enough power in the cross to save everybody. But what they fail to understand is that it's not power that saves, but justice being satisfied. It's not some mystical power or some mystical force that saves people, but it's actually Jesus rendering satisfaction to the wrath of God that saves people. And so if the atonement was to be sufficient enough to save everybody, Jesus would have had to have had more sin imputed to him and had to have more wrath poured out on him in order for that to happen. And we know that that's not the case because God is not an unjust God. God would not have poured out more, more wrath on his son than was necessary to uh, be poured out. God only poured out as much wrath as his people deserved. And we know that there are different amounts of wrath from the passage we just cited where Jesus referred to judgment being more tolerable for certain groups. God judges with equity. 
we see in the book of Proverbs, we've read through the Proverbs, we see that evil men don't understand justice. These Calvinists show that they don't understand justice. We can talk about more ways where they deny the gospel. They deny the gospel in that they say God has a general love for everybody. They deny the gospel in that they say that God has a general common grace towards everybody. God doesn't show grace or unmerited favor to anybody outside of his son. The favor of God, the blessing of God is only given in his son on the basis of his work. It's not in things like rain and sunshine. God, Psalm 92, 7 refutes that idea. It says when the wicked do flourish and they all do prosper or spring up as the grass, it is that they should be destroyed forevermore. So when good things occur and happen to the wicked or the reprobate, the purpose of those good things being given is that they would be destroyed. Just like a farmer fattens up a calf. I'm sure that that calf thinks that he's being treated mighty fine until what occurs? He's slaughtered. He's killed. He's butchered. All of that that was given to him that appeared good to him was only, was only given so that he might be fattened up for the slaughter. And it's the same with God when he gives good things to the reprobate. There's no such thing as common grace, as the Calvinists say. <clears throat> and so we could go on. We could talk about more heresies that they, they espouse, such as the well-meant offer, synergistic sanctification, etc. But we're going to move on to the one of the more subtle groups of sovereign gracers. These sovereign grace men, they call Arminianism heresy. They call Calvinism the Calvinism that we just talked about, heresy. They say these people who speak peace to people who have no peace, that, they, that they're false teachers. And they say that the gospel is that Jesus Christ died to save the elect alone by satisfying the wrath of God in his death and then imputing his righteousness to his people through faith. They say that this is the gospel that all people are to believe, but yet then they depart in subtle ways. One of the first ways we can talk about they depart, one of the heresies that came up in their group was annihilationism. Some men were introduced into this group or were in this group already and they started to teach that when you die, first of all, they would say that you just sleep until the resurrection. And we know that that's false because the Bible does make a mind uh, body distinction in several places that we've saw. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. <clears throat> and so we know that that's false, but that, that's one of the root ideas of that heresy is that they make no mind-body distinction. They say it's all one thing. But if that's the case, then and we know that some of them have said what would have happened to Jesus on the cross is that he would have been annihilated. And if Jesus is annihilated, what does that mean about Jesus? It means that he wasn't God. And if he wasn't God, then there's no salvation for his people. And that's what they teach is the judgment of the reprobate. Is that they're in hell for a time, and then they are just destroyed. Meaning they cease to exist. But we know that hell is eternal. Why? Because no man can satisfy the wrath of God. What did Jesus do? He satisfied God's wrath by the power of his indestructible life. Meaning the fact that he was God. That's what enabled him to satisfy God's wrath. What does it mean that God's wrath is satisfied? Well, it means that the father stopped pouring his wrath out on his son. He was content in what his son had accomplished. And so he stopped. Was Jesus annihilated? No. He told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Meaning, meaning what? Was, uh, was the thief bodily in heaven with Jesus Christ? No. The thief's soul was with the soul of Christ in paradise. Jesus' body was in that tomb for three days and three nights. And then it was glorified and he rose. And so if these annihilationists wanted to be consistent in their heresy, 
when they say that people are annihilated in hell, and a lot of them do say that they're annihilated because they satisfy God's wrath, they shouldn't say that they're annihilated because of a result, the result of their satisfaction of wrath. They should say that these people should get raised if they satisfy God's wrath. Because that's what happened to Jesus when he satisfied God's wrath. He wasn't annihilated, he was raised. But annihilation denies the justice of God in that <clears throat> it says that we don't deserve an eternity in hell for the sins that we've committed against an infinitely holy God. And that's exactly what that means. If God is holy and he is infinite and he is eternal, then sinning against him would, would require eternal punishment. And the fact that when we go to hell, like we talked about this morning, you know, people, or when pe when the reprobate go to hell, when they go there and they're judged eternally in, in the resurrection, um, there's bodies there with souls in them. They're people. They're being judged. They're being tormented. They're experiencing pain. They're also acting with their will. Meaning they're doing what? They're sinning. They're continuing to sin. And if they're continuing to sin in hell, then they are continuing to incur judgment. If God would stop pouring his wrath on, out on them, the, the judgment that they just incurred because of the sin they just committed would go unpunished for. So annihilationism is something that's then brought up in this group of sovereign grace circles that many people believe and many people have been led astray to believe. And it is a heresy that denies the justice of God and it also denies our depravity. Because our sin is so great it deserves eternity in hell. If you say our sin deserves anything less than what it deserves, then you're saying our sin is something that is not. You're saying that it's better than what God says it is. You're saying that it's not as heinous as what God says it is. God says it's so heinous it deserves eternal in, eternity in hell. God says that the sin of his elect is so heinous that he had to pour out his wrath on his son in order to satisfy it. In order to be a just God and a savior. God says that sin is so heinous in his sight that when the God-man came to earth, God the Father forsook his son, the son that he loved. And you say that all those who advocate annihilationism, they say all the sin, all that that sin deserves is a time in fire and then poof, you're gone. Their judgment about sin is not the same as God's judgment about sin. They deny God's justice. Evil men do not understand justice. They show that they're unconverted. They depart the faith. Even though they would call Arminianism heresy, even though that they would say that Calvinists are heretics, they would look at James White and John MacArthur and all these people who speak peace to Arminians and deny the gospel in the way we just talked about, and they would say these men are heretics, but yet they're departing the faith themselves by teaching annihilationism. And then this group, they also teach antinomianism. Because what do they deny? They say that sanctification is only imputed. Meaning what? Meaning that God takes his holiness. That's what sanctification is. Separateness, holiness. And he takes his holiness and he imputes it to his people. But then in their lives... They are not set apart whatsoever. There's no such thing as practical sanctification. They look at John MacArthur and others who teach progressive sanctification. And yeah, we don't agree with how they teach progressive sanctification. We say that's wrong because what John MacArthur, I'm speaking about him because he wrote a book. It's called The Gospel According to Jesus. And in that book, he picked up an argument in between Zane Hodges and uh, those who, Zane Hodges was somebody who who, who advocated that there is no such thing as good works whatsoever, and so he was completely lawless. But then John MacArthur picked it up, and and he said that he 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 start he taught lordship what's become to what's come to be known as lordship salvation. And so both of those teachings are false. Lordship salvation is false, in that it teaches that your assurance comes from that. It teaches that you can't have assurance 
if you're in sin, it teaches that you're cooperating with God in your sanctification because he says that it's synergistic, that it's you cooperating with God and doing good works. But it does not, we don't look at that false teaching and then jump into another ditch and say that there's no such thing as practical sanctification for God's people. Because we know that God's people do do good works by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's just, let's look at that simply. Sanctification means set apart. We know that by nature we're born into this world hating God, hating each other, totally depraved. Every intention of the thoughts of our heart are evil and evil continually. So then when we're converted, when God sends his gospel to us, and by the Spirit, he gives us a new mind, and he gives us faith, and then we begin to walk in good works, or love towards God and love towards neighbor. Does the world do that? No, they don't. And so we're not going to boast in the fact that we do that. We're just stating the fact, the obvious fact, that that is so. We love God because he's first loved us. And we recognize that, as Paul recognized that, when he wrote to the people in Thessalonica, and he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, So he spoke of something that's practical. He spoke of something that we do. He didn't speak of imputation. And then he called it sanctification. Because why? Because the world is in depravity. Before we're converted, we're depraved. We don't love God. We hate God. Even if we say that we love God in false religion, we still hate God. That outward appearance of love towards God is it love towards God. It's hatred towards God because we're worshiping him falsely in idolatry from wrong motives to be seen by men. But yet when we're converted, we do love the God who laid his life down for us, who gave his son as a ransom for our sin. And that is sanctified because the spirit produces it. The spirit produces that in his people. There's, you can't look at the work of the Holy Spirit and say that it's something that's unholy. I'm using the term unholy, holiness and sanctification. Those are two terms that go together. They're, they're, they mean separateness. If something's separate, it's not like this. And so God's people, when they do good works by the power of the Spirit, they are separate. Now here's a question. Yeah, the, the, the scripture doesn't use, put the two terms together, progressive sanctification. But do you grow in that as a Christian? Do you grow in your love of God and your love towards your neighbor? Yes, God's people do. If there's no growth, then there's no life. Just like a baby, if a baby's not growing, if a puppy stops eating, stops drinking, stops being nourished, and he's and as a result, he's not growing, he's, he, he, what happens? He dies. And so if there's no growth in the Christian's life, and, and what his life consists of is loving God and loving his neighbor, being rooted and founded in the gospel, Then it, then it demonstrates that the Christian is not a Christian. It's not that we're justified because of that. We're not justified because of that sanctification. That sanctification that God produces in his people and the sanctification that he imputes to his people, the sanctification that is his son's life that is imputed to his people, 
Those two do not mix. One is the ground of our justification, the fact that we have this sanctification imputed to us. God imputes the righteousness of his son to his people, which is his perfect perfection. The fact that he perfectly loved the father his whole entire life. And the fact that he perfectly demonstrated, demonstrated love to those who were his neighbor. And then he imputes his holiness to his people, which is his separateness from those who are around him, which is his holiness. He takes that and he imputes it and it's perfect and he imputes it to his people. And then God accepts his people on that basis. And they are a hundred percent accepted because of Jesus's doing and dying. And there's nothing else to be added to it. But then there's something else that Jesus earned for his people on the cross. It's nothing that contributes to us being accepted, but it's something that Jesus accomplished. It, Jesus didn't just come to save his people from the condemnation of sin. He also came to save his people from the power of sin. He didn't come to save a people and, and grant them a faith that believes that he is the righteousness, but then in believing this, his people just act contrary to that. His people just continually hate him and continually hate each other. His people just remain totally depraved. He didn't die so that his people would be totally depraved the rest of their lives and never do a good work and never never love each other or love God at all. The book of Titus. Chapter 2. I just go to this passage a lot because I think it's one of the most clearest passages about this. It says that in verse 11 of chapter 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem for us redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Speak these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So it must be important. It says that. The word that. It means this is a part of why he died. That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify him for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The cross makes his people zealous for good works. And the world is not zealous for good works. The world, by the cross, comes to hate God more. The cross does the opposite for the reprobate. It causes them to hate God more in light of Jesus dying. We see that in the religious world all the time. When we make known to them the death of Christ for the elect to save them alone, they come to hate God. They say things like, well, if God makes uh, people come to Christ against their will, that would make God a rapist. Or that I can't serve the God who prepares vessels of wrath for destruction. That God is a monster. So what R.C. Sproul, Sproul called God in his book, uh, Chosen, Chosen by God, he said the God of double predestination is a monster. And so the gospel, the good news, it makes God's people more zealous for wicked works. But the gospel, when it's revealed to God's people, it causes them to be zealous for good works. And we're pointing this out because this is a heresy of those who would say that Arminianism is heresy, who would say that the Calvinism uh, of those who speak peace to those who have no peace is heresy. They say that we're not sanctified in our lives. And why do they say this? They say that well, those who say that, they're legalist because there's only one kind of sanctification. It's the sanctification that justifies and you can't add to that sanctification. We're not saying that you can add to that sanctification. This is a different sanctification that's not imputed, but it's created by God in his people. When they hear the gospel, it causes them to love God more. The one who would say that they're not sanctified Practically, 
He also needs to say that he continually hates God all the days of his life and he never loves God. That's the only way that you can say that we're not sanctified in our lives because the world doesn't love God. And so if you do love God, then that sets you apart by definition. That's just how words work. They have definitions. They, uh, they mean things. So God's people are sanctified. And uh, so now one of the other ways that people, some people would say we know that we're, yeah, we're sanctified in, um, in our lives. But then what do they do, do to deny that? They redefine sin. They redefine sin. One of the most prevalent sins we've saw to be redefined is uh, adultery. They say that you can divorce people and that there's grounds for divorce and then that you can remarry. Well, Jesus called that adultery. And if anybody would like to question about the passage where he says in Matthew 19, except on the ground of fornication, well, that ground, you need to turn back to the law, what it was, what Jesus was referring to was those who would take a virgin as their wife and then they would find that that virgin was not really a virgin. That's what ground under the old covenant he was talking about where you could put away your wife. Because if you would put her away, what he was speaking to those in Israel who were still under the old covenant, that was the context. And, and uh, they, they were to put that woman to death if she was found not to be a virgin because she was lying to her husband. She was. Uh, already she was she was seeking to commit defilement with her husband she was seeking to commit adultery with her husband and so she was to be put to death stoned and put to death and if she was stoned and put to death then he was free to marry because what she was dead and death is the only thing that ends a marriage and so these people they seek to redefine sin they they say that we can set certain things before our eyes that are sinful and those things are wrong and i'm not saying that christians don't battle with these things. I'm not saying that Christians are not tempted by these things, but Christians should not be people who seek to justify these things. Because when we seek to justify this pattern of behavior that's sinful, what are we doing? We're calling good evil and evil good. And when we call good evil and evil good, when we redefine what sin is, then we're going to continually live in sin all of our life. We're, con we're continually hating God. We, we, we shouldn't look for a way to justify our sin. That's a very dangerous place. Because what? Because why? It's not because looking for a way to justify your sin causes you to lose your salvation, but it demonstrates that you don't have it because it's demonstrating that your heart still hates God. Your heart hasn't been changed to love God. You don't know God. Your heart is still one of self-righteousness. Yeah, you might proclaim the Jesus who saved his people from uh, their sin by his death. But why are you doing that? You're not doing that because you're, you've been given a heart to love his glory and hate your own glory. Because why would you be justifying your sin? Because you're concerned about yourself and your own glory. Your own persona being magnified in this world. The heart is deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? The natural man can make him, make himself believe that he believes something that he doesn't. And so we want to be a people as God's people who let God be true and every man, even us, be a liar. We want to come to this word and accept it as it is, interpret it how it should be interpreted, read it how it should be read, and then we, we have confidence in God that he's given us this faith, that he's working in us, that he will cause us to do this. And we're leaning on him. We're not looking to our own understanding. We're putting our faith in him and letting him direct our path. We're not seeking to work it out in our own wisdom, in our own, in our own ways, trying to guide ourselves. We want to be a people who worships and serves him in spirit and in truth and finally i wanted to bring up one more heresy that we're familiar with and that heresy we've been around people seem very fluent very honest about what the scripture says like they're teaching the gospel of god's grace they're exposing the lie they're setting forth the truth they're contrasting 
They're, they're setting forth the antithesis. And then they depart. And one of the ways that they depart is through the doctrine of covenant children. Teaching that children are just born into the covenant. And then they tell you to catechize your children as if they are already a part of the people of God, as if they already believe these doctrines. But we know from what we talked about last week that the covenant of grace is not entered through physical birth, but through the supernatural rebirth of the Holy Spirit. The covenant of grace, you don't gain entrance into the covenant of grace through physical circumcision or through baptism of water or through your mama and daddy's faith, but you gain entrance into the new covenant through, through spiritual circumcision of the heart. It's not of the letter, it's of the spirit. It's supernatural. It's God giving you a new will and then giving you faith to believe the good news of what he has done. This is what we are to proclaim against that which um, opposes it. Some of that which opposes it. We are to set forth the truth against the lie. And we're to do this having our speech seasoned with salt. And one thing, we're up against a lot as God's people because I think for every doctrine that, that is set forth in Scripture, and we, I'm not saying doctrines, we, we just said Scripture is all one doctrine, all the doctrines of Scripture form together to create one doctrine. <clears throat> but for every doctrine taught in Scripture, there's people in the world who believe the opposite of it. I think, I mean, er everything that we know about the Word of God, there are people who would say, that's not true, this is true. So that, that's, that's how, you know, how much we have to contend with. And there's not a doctrine that everybody who would say that they're a Christian agrees with and not all doctrines are primary but i'm just making the point of how many different variations there are of what what would call itself christianity i don't think of, of like other religions like islam or judaism we know that there's different sects within those religions but i think christianity by far and has more variations of it more disagreements within it than any other religion on the face of the earth. And it's because it's the one true religion. And it's because the, the religion, it, it's the religion that the devil is seeking to attack. That's why that is so. And that's what we have to contend with. Remember what Paul said to Timothy. That imposters will grow worse and worse. <laughs> Meaning there's going to be more heresies. And then some people think that, you know, heresy is like something we don't even need to really, really deal with that much. Like we witnessed down in Georgia. I'm not going to set forth all these doctrinal errors against the truth. These people don't need to uh, be concerned with that all the time. But, I mean, there's all these passages we just brought up where Scripture is concerned with it. And then we know from reading Scripture, Christ was all the time con contrasting the lie from the truth. And one of the reasons for that is because we understand in that way. We understand things better that way when we see things in terms of opposites. God created the lie. God, God, God brought forth that which is contrary to his truth that his people might understand and know his truth better for the good of the church. God works everything for the good of his people. And so, so there's a few more passages I wanted to bring up uh, in Defending the gospel that we believe and knowing how to answer each one and to give a defense for our faith and speaking the good news. You know, we're commanded to do that by Christ. We're created to be a people to do that by Christ because this is how God is glorified. I mean, listen to how the saints prayed in Acts. When they prayed in Acts, what did they pray like? They were just like citing scripture and proclaiming who God is. They're proclaiming who God is to God. Because this is how God is magnified. Do you not think God wills that you would proclaim and announce to others who he is in your speech, in your testimony? Again, it's not something that we just do on Sundays and then go and live our lives like the rest of the world because we're not like the rest of the world. God has did something to us. He's created in us a new heart. Jeremiah thirty-two thirty-nine says, And I have given to them one heart in one way, 
This is something God does. It's not something like he does with our cooperation. It's something that he does is going to come to pass. <coughs> and I have given to them one heart and one way to fear me all the days for the good of them and their sons after them. And I have made a perpetual covenant for them in that I do not turn back from after them for doing good uh, or doing them good. And I put my fear in their heart so as not to turn aside from me. And I have rejoiced over them to do them good and have planted them in this land in truth with all my heart and with all my soul. So notice one of the things I want to point out about this passage is that he says, I put my fear in their heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says that I put my fear in their heart so as not to turn aside from me. Meaning the purpose of God placing his fear in them is so that they will not turn aside from God. And then recognizing that fear, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Having known therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And we are revealed to God, and I also hope to have been revealed in your consciences. So understanding God's fear that he had placed in his heart, Paul seeks to persuade others. Paul seeks to pro proclaim the gospel to those who are his brothers that he doesn't know yet. Now, everyone that he proclaimed the gospel to was not his brother. But when we go into the world, we proclaim the gospel. We're doing so that God would bring forth his church. We're doing so for the sake of the elect, that they would be converted. And if we know the fear of the Lord, if that's been given to us in our heart, we'll do the same as Paul did. First um, Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people acquired that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You once had not found mercy, but now have found mercy. And so God says, you are this. You are my church. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation. You are a people acquired so that, just like Titus, Jesus died so that he would make his people zealous for good works. This is phrased the same way. You are made his people so that you might proclaim his excellencies. God made you his people to proclaim who he is, that he would be glorified in you, his body. Jesus says in John 18, 37, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. So Christ was sent into this world also, not just to die, but while he was in the world to proclaim the truth. Jesus Christ was someone who answered those who were in his path, who gave a defense of who he was, of what he was coming into the world to do. He proclaimed the gospel to others. He proclaimed his glory. And so we as his body are to do the same. He was the word of God incarnate. In John 17, 18, Jesus said, as you sent me into the world, so also I send him into the world. So there's the connection. He was sent into the world to proclaim the truth, to uh, to bear witness to the truth. And so in the same way that he was sent into the world, Jesus says in his prayer to his father that he sends his people into the world. Why are you left here as God's people? Why, when God saved you, did he not just take you up into heaven? Why? Why? God's people, if you are his, if you believe this gospel, if you glory in the truth and not in your flesh, if you have no confidence in the flesh, if you've been given a true faith by God, you were given a true faith and you were left here and you were not just brought up into heaven because God left you here. He sent you into this world to proclaim the truth to others, to announce the truth. To others we're aliens and sojourners here we're not of this world this is not our home we're left here what does he mean he says as you sent me into the world i also send them into the world are we not in the world when we're converted he says i send them into the world 
there's a taking out of the world when you're regenerated and then a sending back in. There's a commission, there's a mission that you're sent back into this world for. You're taken out of the world, meaning the world system and everything of the world because that's what you were of before you were born again and then you're sent into it. Not to be of it, but to expose it and to proclaim the truth to it, to those who are still in it, that God might take them out of the world and send them back in, that they might do the same and announce his glory to the multitudes. Because that's what God's people are to be about, is proclaiming who he is. They're not to be about just living their life in the here and now, trying to have a good job, a nice family, three cars, a good house, I'm not saying all those things are bad, but what I'm saying is that they're not what the Christian is to be living for. The Christian is to understand that he is an alien and sojourner here, and he's to hold these things that he's been given by God lightly, storing his treasure up in heaven, because that's where his heart is, because that's where his home is. And while he's here, he's to be concerned with God's glory, because he's been sent into the world in the same way that Christ was sent into the world, and that is to bear witness to the truth. And so, finally, I wanted to bring up one more point. If I could find it. Going back, I, I left out one idea I just wanted to address before we end. Uh, when we were talking about how to read scripture and um, interpret it correctly. And while we've been in this passage for the past three weeks, just pulling out different ideas, different doctrines, is um, because, because these doctrines are what would have clicked in the minds of Paul's readers when they were read this in the context of the church in Colossae, because they were familiar with Scripture. And when Paul, like for instance, when Paul wrote to Timothy and and he used certain terminology that was in earlier scriptures or earlier passages, they would have clicked in Timothy's, Timothy's mind, not only because Timothy was familiar with these passages, but because when Paul wrote these things, the same spirit who wrote the Bible was in them that is in us. And so... The Spirit of God is the one who's going to bring these things to our mind when we're reading it. When we're reading, that's why when we read these things, cer certain things, we think about other passages of Scripture. It's because the same Spirit who is in them is also working in us. And so when we go to these Scriptures, we don't want to compartmentalize it because the Scripture wrote the whole of Scripture and He's working in us to reveal to us His truth, to testify to us the truth if that makes sense. And so if I could encourage you this week just to think about the things that we have talked about here to proclaim the truth to others so that God's people would be born again, that God would use that testimony to regenerate his elect and that he would also use that testimony to judge the reprobate. And we rejoice in both. We praise God that he has revealed the truth to some and he has hidden it from others because we know that's what this creation is all about, is God's glory, is God making himself known. And this, this, this creation, this earth, this universe was not created so that we could live in it and enjoy it for our own pleasure and our own benefit and because we're not God. God is God. And God loves himself. And we, we rejoice in that. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we know that you are God. We know that there is no other God in heaven or on earth besides you. You have created the universe. That uh, you have created it for your own purpose, to magnify and to demonstrate who you are. And that we would praise you in light of who you are. And that you would be magnified and praised and worshipped in all that we do. We give thanks to you, knowing that we have nothing that we have that we have not received from you, that all of this knowledge that we know about you has been given to us 
by you. We didn't learn it of our own in intellect. But um, you revealed it unto us and you caused us to love it because by nature we hate it. By nature, we don't want to even admit that it's true because we're concerned with ourselves, because we're fallen in the lie that the serpent told the woman in the garden. And that lie is that we shall be as God. And we know, having been set free from that lie, the doctrine of that lie, that seed, that you are God and we are not, that you are the potter and we are the clay, and you mold us and you shape us how you will, how you've purposed to be more like your son. We pray that you would do that this week and cause us that we would be a people of prayer, that you would cause us that we would be a people who worship you, who read your testimony, who seek to be conformed to the precepts of your word because it testifies of who your son is. And we know that your word testifies of his person, of your person, of the spirit's person. And these three are one. We pray, Lord, that you would add to our number. We pray, Lord, that you would regenerate those who are yours in this area. And we would have fellowship with them in worshiping you. And that you would be of first importance in our lives. And that you would forgive us when we do sin against you and act contrary to what we believe. And we know that you do forgive us on the basis of your son and his blood. that satisfies your holy wrath. We have confidence in that. We pray in your name and for your glory. Amen.